come to an Orthodox church for the Divine Liturgy on a Sunday morning. When you arrive, if you arrive at the stated time the Divine Liturgy is supposed to start, you'll probably walk in and find that worship is already going on. In some churches, there's a preliminary service that's just 15 or 20 minutes called hours. Other churches do a longer service that might stretch to an hour or more, a service called matins or orthros. Don't feel bad about it. Come on in. And you might notice that the room is not full yet. And as the first prayers and hymns of the Divine Liturgy continue and progress, more and more worshipers will come in. Orthodox are not often very punctual about when they get to, to worship, something that annoys the pastors and they remind them of it, but uh, they still tend to trickle in all through the first opening minutes of the service. You'll notice that uh, early in the service we sing a couple of antiphons. These were, um, these were hymns that were sung in ancient times while people were still making their way to church. And there will be a little ceremony called the Little Entrance where the priest and the other altar servers leave the altar, go out in front of the iconostasis, and then come back in again through the central doors, the, the royal doors. It's called the little entrance. And that used to be at the point at which Sunday worship in church would begin. So now it happens maybe 15 minutes into the service. Not too long after that, we will sing hymns about the, um, we'll sing the hymn um, that's the appointed hymn, for the patron of that church. If it's St. Paul, it'll be the hymn that's dedicated to St. Paul. If the church, as mine is, is named Holy Cross, we'll sing a hymn about the Holy Cross. After that, a couple of hymns about the events or the saints of the day, a hymn to the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos. Pretty soon into a hymn called the Trisagion. Trisagion means thrice holy, so it's the hymn that that the seraphim sang to each other in Isaiah's vision, holy, holy, holy. We have a slightly expanded version. We sing, holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. And as we sing it, you'll notice worshipers make the sign of the cross with each repetition. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. And when they finish making that cross, many of them, not everybody necessarily, will bow, reach down to touch the ground. Or if you're old like me, to gesture toward the ground, even if you can't quite touch it. That's called making a matanya. A matanya is the sign of the cross, followed by reaching down to the ground. Some Orthodox traditions, you reach down first and then make the cross as if you were picking up your cross, as if you're accepting the cross that the Lord has given you. Immediately after the Trisagion hymn, we'll have the first scripture reading. This is always a reading from the epistle, from one of the letters of St. Paul, from St. James, St. John, or any of the other epistles. This reading is quite often or usually done by a parishioner, a member of the church, who just walks up to the front of the church, stands on that little riser in front of the iconostasis. The little riser is called the solea, stands there and then reads the epistle. We'll read the epistle not from an ordinary Bible, but from a, a large book, sometimes with an ornate binding. That book is called The Epistle. It contains all the epistles, and that's all it contains. It lists them in order as we read through them during the course of the church year. So they'll read from the apostolos, to use the Greek word, or the epistle book. And when that's finished, we hear the gospel. In this case, we have something of a procession. The altar boys come out, they're bearing candles, and now it will be either the deacon or the priest reads the gospel reading. Everyone stands up for the gospel reading. And after the gospel reading, the priest may do his homily, his sermon, right then. In some Orthodox churches, they prefer to just continue with worship and save the homily or the sermon for the very end. At the end of the gospel, or the end of the sermon, if he does the sermon immediately, there will be the prayer over the catechumens. Now, the catechumens are people who are planning to join the Orthodox Church. They're still in a process of education and learning. And at this point in the Divine Liturgy, they come forward and they stand in front of the icon of Christ while the deacon or the priest says a prayer over them. 
The next notable part of the service is the cherubic hymn. It's called that because as we sing it, we are representing the cherubim and the seraphim who cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. After this hymn is sung, there is the great entrance. We had that little entrance earlier on when the, the priest and the, the altar party just made a little detour outside of the iconostasis back in again. In the great entrance, the priest and all the altar servers with candles, with the processional cross, with all kinds of things, with the incense, makes a large progression all the way out from the north door of the iconostasis to the back wall of the church and up the center aisle again, coming through the midst of the people. And as they pass by, worshipers will sometimes reach out and touch the hem of the priest's garment as he passes. This reminds us, of course, of the, the woman who was ill and was, was afraid to ask Jesus for healing, but touched just the hem of his garment, and she was healed. As the priest goes by, he reads the prayers that were requested for loved ones, members of the family, of the person who baked the communion bread that day, but also everyone else that's on the, the parish prayer list or anything going on in the news, perhaps, or some significant occurrence that, that needs prayer. As he passes by, if you're thinking about someone you're praying for, you reach out and touch the hem of his garment, just symbolically attaching your prayers to those intercessory prayers. An element of worship from the earliest centuries is called the kiss of peace. This is when worshipers turn to each other, and uh, in the Orthodox service we say, Christ is in our midst, and respond, he is and ever shall be. And at that point we exchange a kiss. Uh, some Orthodox churches, cultures do it, just two cheeks, some do one, two, three. Um, in some churches they uh, prefer just to touch fingertips or touch fingertips to the lips and then to the fingertips of the other person. Um, usually not a big hearty hug, usually not a handshake in Orthodox churches. Where this custom has been readopted in some Western liturgical churches, a hug or handshake might be typical. Often in St. Paul's letters, he talks about greeting the brethren with a holy kiss. So this, this kiss was part of our worship from very early on. The unity of the congregation, the unity of the faithful holding the same faith, is what enables us to love each other and what enables us to keep the faith itself. And that's why immediately after the kiss of peace, we go into the Nicene Creed. We recite this creed that was written in the fourth century to say what we know, what we believe about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Creed was written in the fourth century at uh, two large ecumenical councils bringing together all the leading clergy of the time to settle some, some heretical ideas and some theological questions that were going around at that time. And they were able to settle it in a statement that they all agreed on. Very soon after that, we go into the communion prayers. And from there, we go into some very ancient prayers going back to the very earliest centuries of Christian faith in which the priest recounts all that God has done for us. And he talks about him sending his son to save us. And he talks about how our Lord said, this is my body, this is my blood. After that, the priest asks for the Holy Spirit to come and to bless the bread and the wine that they will become the body and blood of Christ. When the communion prayers are done, where the bread and wine has been consecrated, first the priest, the deacons, those at the altar receive communion. And then after that, the priest will come out with a chalice ready to give communion to the people. People will line up. And what was quite surprising to me is that the chalice, of course, has wine in it, but there is no bread that's given to you in your hand. Instead, the bread has been placed into the wine. And with a spoon, the priest lifts out a little morsel of bread and some wine and delivers it to each person. The person receiving communion comes and stands directly in front of the priest, opens their mouth wide, and uh, usually altar boys on either side are holding a red cloth beneath your chin in case anything is dropped. And you receive communion and then go back to your place in the congregation. As you return, there will be a basket of bread that's been cut up into chunks. 
Now, our communion bread is bread in loaf form, bread that is risen, usually round loaves. And what is consecrated, made the, the body of Christ, is a cube from the very center of the loaf that the priest has taken out, prayed over, blessed, and placed in the chalice. The rest of the loaf, though, is cut up into chunks, and it's blessed bread, but it's not communion bread. Anyone can partake of this blessed bread, which is called antidoron, that is, in place of the gifts. So someone who is receiving communion may pick up a couple of pieces of antidoron, bring it back to where they were standing in the congregation, and give it to people around them who were not going up for communion that day. After everyone has received communion, we go back to our places, and there are a few closing prayers. And then either listen to the priest's sermon, hear some announcements, then we're ready to go downstairs and get something to eat. <laughs> <laughs>